I want to talk to uh, about uh, the archaeology of Iowa City. Um, Iowa City, it, the region around Iowa City really wasn't considered to be that spectacular archaeologically early on. There are lots of regions in Iowa that have, uh, as soon as settlers came to the state, uh, w they, they viewed uh, the prehistoric sites to be quite remarkable. Like we all know about the uh, effigy mound manifestation in, in uh, far northeast Iowa. And there was the uh, Glenwood uh, cultures in far southwest Iowa where you have earth lodge on top of earth lodge on top of earth lodge. And you have these huge late prehistoric uh, village sites all along the uh, Mississippi River Valley uh, in southeast Iowa. Uh, those were remarked upon very early and uh, uh, early settlers oohed and odd over it. But in, in much of the interior of Iowa, including along uh, Johnson County, along the Iowa River, there was a few passing mentions of a couple of mounds, groups uh, in the area. But other than that, there really wasn't much considered to be remarkable about the area. But there's some, but the area around Johnson County is remarkable for the number of sites that are within it. Uh, there are uh, 16, uh, uh, sorry, 1,400 sites within Johnson County, uh, you know, which, which uh, is, is just kind of off the charts. I mean, it's, you'd have to uh, look at other regions. For example, uh, uh, the Glenwood area and also uh, the Mines of Spain region where there's a lot of early historic stuff might have slightly more sites per, per square mile than Johnson County, but Johnson County is pretty intensively uh, uh, pockmarked with sites. Uh, so why are there so many sites in Johnson County? One, the, the primary reason I think is because the Office of the State Archaeologist is located here at the university. So that means uh, we, we hear about all these sites and we find a lot of sites when we work here. And also our, uh, uh, the other departments within the university, such as anthropology or geoscience or the geological survey, the State Historical Society, the Natural History Museum, they're all hearing about these sites and they're all funneling it to the OSA. And so we, 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 we tend to hear about just about everything that's out there, whereas in other parts of the state we don't hear nearly as much. Um, and we also have a culture, I think, within Iowa City of, uh, I think people are a little bit more trusting of state government. You know, if you see somebody from the state asking questions, you're not going to be as suspicious as uh, perhaps other regions of the state might be. Uh, you know, it's because uh, either, either you work for the university or somebody in your family works for the university. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's very easy to find out information about sites, whereas if you go into s some more rural areas of Iowa, they're very suspicious if you show up and knock on their door and ask to walk on their property. Um, the other thing we have is, uh, unlike a lot of the state, uh, Iowa City ha has been expanding and there's been a lot of development in Iowa City and in Johnson County uh, since cultural resource management began in the 1970s. Cultural resource management is professional archaeology where if you have like a big highway project and you need a, a federal permit or a contract, you have to do survey first. Uh, because Iowa City, Coralville, and, and the whole community is, is expanding, we have a lot more of that going on. Uh, in fact, uh, yes. These, the pink areas are the areas that, are, that were recorded as professionally surveyed. And this isn't even totally complete because large portions of the uh, Coralville, essentially all of the Coralville uh, 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 Lake Basin has been archeologically surveyed. And so this map shows 0.7%, and I think if you include the Coralville Reservoir, we've got at least 1% of the county has been professionally surveyed uh, for archaeological resources. And that's because of this uh, growth and development that we have in Johnson County that you don't necessarily see in other parts of the state. Uh, I could give you an example of uh, how, the, how this sometimes plays out. Uh, a woman was gardening in her uh, backyard in uh, the east side of Iowa City and she came across a little, uh, a little arrowhead in her garden. And she was very excited about it, and so she knew somebody, and they said, well, why don't you uh, contact the Department of Anthropology? Uh, so they sent her to Matt Hill, and Matt Hill's four-year-old son is good friends with my four-year-old son, and so uh, she got referred to me at the OSA, and uh, pretty soon I figured out that she, she actually owned uh, a sour apple tree that I used to pick apples from when I had an apple press and grinder, and so I actually knew her already. And so she was very chatty and it was very friendly. And so we were able to get like one little site that plopped on the map uh, just because of the, these connections. And you're not gonna get that in anywhere else, anywhere else in the state. Uh, so it, it really just blossoms the number of, of, of sites that we find in Johnson County. And when I was preparing for this, 
I, I, had, to I had to decide what my uh, boundaries were going to be for this, for this survey. Because there's 1,400 sites in Johnson County. I'm not a masochist. I wanted to really narrow it down. So I decided to make a five kilometer radius uh, around the Museum of Natural History and just look at the sites within there. And this five kilometer radius includes pretty much all of Iowa City. Um, and by looking at that, I can, I, can, I can give a nice presentation on what we've been finding in Iowa City. And there's all kinds of neat stuff going on in other parts of the county and other parts of the state. But I'm just going to focus on you know, a, a five kilometer radius uh, around the downtown Iowa City. Um, this is a, a pretty traditional timeline. And I, I ordered it stratigraphically. The uh, oldest is at the bottom, and the youngest is at the top. Uh, you know, at, and within this uh, five kilometer radius, I took every site within it, and I classified it based upon the age of the material that came from it, and based upon what other people had said about the site. There's a lot of them we just don't know. These gray ones are prehistoric sites where uh, you, know, you have flaking debris or fire cracked rock, and you just have no idea how old the prehistoric site is. But for a surprising number of them, um, we could actually determine, uh, almost half of them, we could actually determine a set time period for them. And so we have a wide range, and it's, it's kind of a surprising distribution. Uh, and, and much of Iowa tends to be very heavy on, on the archaic sites, but we're getting a lot less of that in Iowa City. Uh, and we're, we're kind of heavy on the woodland period sites. Uh, and I'll talk about some of the reasons for, for why that might be. So this is, this is my, my study area, uh, uh, this, the archaeological sites that have been recorded around Iowa City. Uh, I'm going to start. I'm going to go through time and uh, start with the Paleo and then work my way up to the historic period uh, so you can see what, what evidence we have of, of prehistoric periods. Uh, the first one is the Paleo and period. Uh, when humans first arrive in Iowa City or uh, Johnson County area about 13,000 years ago, uh, there were still glaciers uh, melting in Iowa, uh, not in Iowa City, but in, in north central Iowa. The Des Moines lobe was still receding. Uh, it was a different environment. It was uh, um, a lot, uh, you know, the the the, the uh, floor probably resembled more more like a, um, you know, northern Canada. Uh, and when humans came to the area, um, they have very distinctive uh, lancelet points uh, with them, and they were probably very mobile hunters and gatherers. Uh, and recent research kind of suggests that they're a lot more uh, uh, involved with the. Uh, 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 plant management and localized resources, and, we, and the, the stereotype of them being big game hunters is kind of outdated. And we have exactly three sites within our study area that have found maybe some Paleo-Indian material in them. Uh, site JH287 uh, is a possible late Paleo-Indian Angostura point found on the surface. Uh, JH446 was reported by a collector, but nobody has seen it. Um, it's just they, they said that they found some Paleo-Indian stuff, but we don't know. Nobody's actually got a picture of it or seen it in person. And JH701 is the only Paleo-Indian site in our study area that's actually been excavated. And they found some prehistoric materials coming from a plow zone, but almost nothing was from below the plow zone. So the site had, had already been messed up by plowing, and there wasn't any intact features. You didn't find any harsh, you didn't find any uh, pits or anything. In of Iowa, there is no Paleo-Indian site that has intact features with an appropriate uh, Paleo-Indian age or appropriate Paleo-Indian artifacts. There are just none. There's been some claims, but they never have any diagnostic material in them or radiocarbon dates with them. Um, but that doesn't mean there isn't some cool stuff in, in Iowa City. Uh, was, when I was researching for this, I came across this photograph of some beautiful late Paleo-Indian points uh, that were collected somewhere south of Iowa City. And uh, judging from the lack of uh, plow nicks, uh, these uh, probably came from a pretty uh, nice context. So somewhere out there, there's, there's a nice Paleo-Indian site. Um, the Archaic Period. So during the Archaic Period, uh, the, the climate slowly starts to warm up. Um, humans really decrease their range in the, the types of resources that they acquire. They start becoming much more specialized in localized resources. Uh, you start seeing a, a flourishing of point types uh, from region to region uh, because people are moving a lot less and so they're sort of uh, becoming localized in how they manufacture stuff. And this was, uh, we had done uh, auger testing and found some prehistoric materials associated with a buried A horizon. A buried A horizon is essentially 
topsoil that has been covered by later material. In this case, the river flooding had covered an old surface and sealed it, and buried a horizons often have excellent preservation. So we're quite excited to find this prehistoric stuff coming from it. We did a one by two test, well we did several one by twos. One of them had a fair amount of material coming from it, including late archaic material. Uh, and so this warranted a full mitigation of this area. Uh, and so we did a 10 meter by 10 meter uh, grid. And uh, actually no, it's a well, 12 meter by 12 meter grid. And we had plans to do all of it, but you know, it, it was a, a big mess as I'll show you. So we, we did the core of the site and uh, we sampled other areas where there was less material coming from it. Uh, it was a big, big muddy mess. Um, I don't, I'm thinking this is too much light on there. Does that, does that help? Does that make any difference? All right. A little bit, yeah. Okay. Uh, so it was a big, big muddy mess in uh, the excavations. We couldn't actually see any material coming out of it because everything is kind of covered with this viscous mud slime. Uh, so you couldn't see if you got an artifact. You, you mean, you might feel it once in a while, but the, the vast majority of the stuff came through screening. And so the site was divided into one meter by one meter squares, and that was subdivided into quarter sections, and they were all excavated at five centimeter levels. So we have this, so this site where essentially we know where everything came from by 50 by 50 centimeter by five centimeter level. So we had pretty good control. Even though we couldn't see anything coming out of the ground, we knew where it came from reasonably well. And so we could do spatial analyses with it. Um, Here's the wet screening. Uh, here's uh, Joe Arts uh, looking at the soils of the buried A horizon. Every morning it was a big swimming pool because we're in the floodplain and it would just fill up with water and uh, we had pumps, pump it all out and then we'd go dig it up and uh, a lot of fun. But because, because we had such good uh, tight control of, as to where things came from, we could, we could recreate what was going at the site. We could look at the types of materials and the types of tools that were being produced and we're able to figure out where people were on the landscape. You know, certain areas they're doing uh, tool maintenance where they're taking their stone points and uh, reflaking them, uh, making them sharper. Uh, in a couple cases, they're actually making new tools. Um, we have a faunal processing area where we find the majority of the bone where they're taking, uh, 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 in this case, deer and uh, butchering deer. Uh, we have harse and we could tell which, which uh, napping areas appear to be working with cores and which are not working with cores. The location of points in a discard area where large pieces apparently were just kind of thrown back from, from the site uh, while they were excavating. And we have this weird deep feature that was just a, a head scratcher that had, uh, I don't know, I'm not going to get into it. I, I, don't know what, I don't know what's going on up in that corner, but the rest of the site I have a, I have a pretty good idea of what's going on. Um, the, the site was, was, has an interesting time period. We, uh, an AMS date came back as 3,800 years ago, and this is a, a kind of a pivotal time period in Iowa prehistory. The oldest known um, uh, evidence, clear evidence of domestic uh, plants in Iowa is dates to about 3,000 years ago uh, at, uh, uh, at uh, Gaspering and San Run sites. Uh, so this is older than the sites that have clear evidence of domestication in eastern Iowa but it's younger than sites that farther to the east and southeast in the United States that have evidence of domestication. So if there's going to be anything older than, uh, than the sites that have clear domestication, it might be these. And one of the th interesting things that was recovered from uh, soil flotation was uh, uh, little barley and may grass, which are not native to this area, but were later used as uh, domesticated food. So whether this means that they're actually have domesticated, have brought it with them, we don't know, or whether it means that they've simply brought some of that with them upriver, because it's not too far away from their natural ranges, we don't know, or it could be that, um, that th th these plants had slightly different ranges prehistorically. But if, if these are being introduced, this is sort of evidence of like the very, very first stages of, of uh, domestication of uh, plants. So kind of vague circumstantial evidence of uh, uh, the early stages of plant domestication at Edgewater. Uh, one thing that I tried to do with the lithics is try to look at the, uh, sp the spear points, the projectile points, and look at the material that came from them, and look at all kinds of sites that have those similar types of uh, uh, table rock and durst points, which are very closely related points th that overlap and are probably the same, same point style, just uh, slightly different variations on it. 
And I would look at this, this, the source of the material and where it came from on the landscape. And it, it sort of indicates that there's movement going up and down the Iowa River uh, Valley. If you look from where a point was found to where its material came from. It gives you an idea of how material is moving and possibly how people are moving as well. Well, at, at the Edgewater Park site, the floral and faunal remains suggest that it was occupied in the late summer or, or early fall and that the material that came from it suggests that they were coming from uh, uh, the regions in the central part of the state based on the chert material that they're reducing to make spear points with. So this kind of suggests that sometime in, f it, it, if uh, the Edgewater Park site is typical, that there may be uh, movements going downriver in fall, um, you know, perhaps towards warmer areas or towards uh, areas that are more productive in, in wintertime uh, in, in the uh, Iowa bottoms down over here. Um, there was one other archaic site that's been excavated that has uh, intact features, and that was the Conklin site. And this was uh, excavated uh, along Oakdale Boulevard in Coralville, uh, kind of close to the Iowa River. When Oakdale Boulevard was being expanded, this, this site was, was in the way and was uh, mitigated. Uh, they had a different technique. They didn't uh, screen the material. What they did is they, they shoveled a, much, a very big area, and then they mapped stuff up as it came. They had an advantage that it wasn't a muddy mess like ours was, so they could actually see material as, it coming, as it's coming up. A disadvantage, to, so an advantage is you can cover a lot of area and it's a lot quicker and a lot faster. A disadvantage is you're gonna miss a lot of the smaller stuff that you'll get, you know, we're doing eighth inch wet screening, whereas here you're gonna miss a lot of stuff that's smaller than a centimeter. So uh, there's advantages and disadvantages to the different methods. And at the Conklin site, they had uh, almost no floral preservation, or at least no, no clear floral preservation, and virtually no faunal preservation. Uh, on the bottom right is some of the points. It's a late archaic uh, site. Uh, the one nice Tipton point in the center there suggests probably 2,500 to 3,500 years ago. Um, they think that they found a uh, house space in at the northern end, but that was based upon bioturbation. There wasn't any post holes. There wasn't any, um, uh, uh, there, there wasn't even, you can't even see like a real increase in uh, artifact density associated with the house. Um, that's, that's the house that they found. So it's, you know, they may, they may have found something up there. Um, so, and, and the Conklin site is pretty typical of archaic archaeology in Iowa in that you, uh, you often don't find many features with them. It's, it's pretty rare that you'll find an, there's a lot of test excavations done on archaic sites, but they're often, they're often busts, either because prehistoric people weren't making features at them, and they're sort of transitory, or it's been so long that any organic evidence of these features has, uh, has simply vanished. It's simply been worked its way through bioturbation and taphonomy, and uh, this, you know, just the natural decay of the organic materials makes, makes the features disappear. And it's only places like the Edgewater Park where you have like something that's nicely deeply buried and preserved in a nice clay that you can get good preservation. Um. Okay, the woodland period. Well, the woodland is known for uh, three big things, uh, domestic plants, pottery, and mounds. All these actually began in the late archaic, but the, that's what the uh, woodland period is known for. And we have a lot of uh, woodland sites in uh, Johnson County, including a lot of mound sites. Mounds uh, could be, in this part of the city, they could be either woodland or late prehistoric. Uh, so you kind of have to take each mound group on its own. And we have one, and, uh, we have one token uh, late prehistoric site, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. So before I get to the mounds, um, uh, I'm going to talk a little about the, the woodland and the woodland sites that have been excavated. Um, so although it's, you know, the woodland period is known for agriculture, it's the, in, in almost every woodland excavation, it's the, the flora associated with uh, domestic crops is overwhelmed by the wild resources. Uh, yes, they, have, they, they were f farming, they were horticulturalists, but most of their food came from wild resources. Um, and in fact, none of the sites that, we've, that have been excavated in the Iowa City area have clearer evidence of domestic plants within them. Um, Let's see, south of town at the Napoleon site, this site was originally uh, brought to uh, people's attention because it was believed to be the location of a, of a, of a late, of a, of a uh, very early historic trading post. 
Um, and as a new water main was being put in by the city, uh, some, uh, uh, through a series of events, it was decided to do uh, excavations at this area. And as it turns out, there wasn't much uh, early historic stuff in there, but there was a, a quite substantially, quite substantial, well-preserved uh, middle woodland site uh, found at Napoleon Park. Um, they actually had archaic early woodland, middle woodland, late woodland, and Oneota artifacts, but most of, almost all of the features were middle woodland. They got 15 pit, pit and hearth features, uh, as well as a, a possible house. Um, it was interpreted as a middle woodland base camp focused on riverine resources. They recovered deer, elk, beaver, fish, turtle, birds. And for flora, they recovered nuts, grapes, mulberry, raspberry, quinopods, amaranth, and knotweeds. Uh, Actually, the, the diet of the people at the Napoleon site in, in the middle woodland wasn't that different from the diet of the people at uh, Edgewater Park, uh, uh, what, 2,000 years earlier. So change is pretty slow in the interior of Iowa. Um, the only other, uh, well, here's more uh, excavations of different features at Napoleon site, uh, different hearths and uh, the possible basin, uh, the possible house feature on top there. Uh, some of the ceramics that came from the site, um, nice middle woodland spring hollow uh, crosshatch. Um, the only other site in, in the study area that had uh, a, a potential for intact uh, 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 woodland, uh, woodland occupation is the Dean Orton site. And this was uh, excavated in Hickory Hill Park uh, it, by University Field School in 2011. Um, we, we knew that there was a site somewhere in Hickory Hill Park because a, a collector had found a lot of stuff back in the 50s and had donated to the state. And so there's like this box of ceramics. And actually, you know what? So there's, the, so there's some examples of the ceramics that came from, that Jack Musgrove had collected. And it was assigned site 13 JH 28. But the site description didn't really match the map location. So we knew that somewhere in the park there was a, a decent site. So we had three weeks, and the first two weeks we had students going out and uh, uh, looking for uh, the site. And of course, uh, on the very last week, uh, they found something. Uh, they found a, wait, a late woodland site that appears to correspond both with the location Musgrove gave and the type of artifacts that he had recovered. Um, so again, there's a uh, buried A, which archaeologists just love. In this case, it isn't fluvial. It uh, was buried by slope wash because it's in a low area and materials washing down and covering uh, the uh, 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 late woodland uh, material. And uh, we got uh, a part of a point, uh, a, late, a very late uh, woodland or even late prehistoric uh, side notch triangular point and a few pieces of pottery, which match fairly well with the, with the Musgrove collection. So we think we found it. Uh, but it was too late. We, we, these, the units that we, the six units we, we excavated pretty much just got down to the buried A horizon. Then we ran out of time and had to fill them back in. So someday, someday, we'll get back there and uh, uh, have, a, have a really awesome field school. Um, so mounds. There, there actually were a surprising number of mounds in, in the Iowa City area. Um, I, I tallied up all the passing references to mounds that I could find, and I got about 115 mounds were in or near the study area. Uh, 13JH1, I've included in the study area because some of the accounts of it suggest that there were mounds going all the way down the landform, which would kind of bump it into our study area. Plus, it's a cool site, so I really wanted to include it. Um, but because of plowing and development, uh, that 115 mounds has been reduced to about 20 that are still extant and maybe four or five are actually still extant within our study area. And I don't know exactly how many there are, and I'll get into that a little bit. Uh, the Asher Mounds, uh, north of town. Uh, this, the, the earliest, uh, how many were found? Uh, the earliest descriptions in 1883 suggested there was 50 mounds at this group. Um, but by the time uh, it was uh, surveyed in 1883, so 50 mounds in uh, 1883, uh, and it was down to uh, about 20 uh, when this map was made. In, when this map, well, it was resurveyed in 1904, and there was about 20 mounds. And now the number of mounds is about 17 or 18, depending on uh, how, you do, how you divide them. So that's the, the largest intact group we have uh, reasonably close to, to Iowa City. 
Uh, a lot of the mounds were excavated in 1863 by an Iowa City druggist named M.W. Davis. And he found uh, several graves, all of them facing to the west and all of them covered with ash. Uh, he excavated a, a nice pot um, that w that's pretty important because it's uh, pretty diagnostic as a late prehistoric uh, artifact. And he even described it back in 1863 as on one side were some rude markings as if a ring with uh, two cross lines and some dots had been drawn with a fine pointed stick where the clay was soft and then straight marks from the ring outward in one direction. And this is supposed to have been designed to represent the sun. The top of the vessel was narrow to a neck, then a head fashioned on it which had some possible resemblance to a turtle's beak. You know, the, the, this is a uh, shell-tempered ceramic piece. It's very typical of the uh, late prehistoric <coughs> Oneota. And he'd also excavated a buffalo effigy, a ceramic buffalo effigy, uh, which nobody has seen since, which is also uh, in indicative of late prehistoric Oneota. Um, that doesn't mean that this, this mound group is necessarily Oneota, but just the, the two artifacts we know from it are Oneota. It could be a woodland mound group, we just don't know. Uh, the, two, two, the two largest mound groups within the study are the Hendricks Berger mound group and the Terrell mound group. Uh, the Hendrix Burger, and these were mapped, uh, this map is, uh, was done by Benjamin Shambaugh of uh, uh, Shambaugh Auditorium fame. He uh, did this in 18, uh, 1904. Uh, the Hendrix Burger group has a uh, soft spot in my heart because this is the first mound group I ever mapped intensively. I've, I've since done mound mapping all over the state, but this is the first time I actually like, took a transit out and tried to map a mound uh, uh, with the total station. Uh, Originally, in 1889, it was noted as having 14 to 16 mounds. By 1904, only eight mounds and two partial mounds were left. Uh, and by the time I and when, by the time I got out there, there was uh, only a handful of mounds that were uh, that were pretty clear. There was there was some excavations done by uh, Ronald Rupé in the 1950s. Uh, but he apparently recovered no diagnostic artifacts, and he took a few photos of the mounds, which don't look anything like the, like the area now. And we do have a collection of artifacts uh, from the mound group. We don't know who, where they came from, if they were from Rupé, and he just didn't talk about them. He never completed a report, so it's, it's very difficult to say what happened um, in the 50s to the mound group. Uh, when I got out there, uh, there was a few clear mounds. This is in uh, somebody's uh, uh, front yard. Um, and I overlaid the uh, 1904 map on what I'd shot in with the total station, and it's not a very clear correspondence. Uh, the owner of this house had mentioned that uh, they had, when they built their house in the 60s, there had been a mound in the driveway, so I knew where one mound was. Uh, mound A was, was in the right position, and two mounds are missing. Then there's a strange mound that we saw in the woods to the north, which uh, doesn't correspond with the previously mapped mound. So either that was a mound that was mismapped or missed or it's something that was created later as a pile or push pile or something. And then there's a long ridge in which there's a couple of maybe clear mounds and then just sort of a blur of, of, uh, of soil, perhaps where somebody had uh, tried to improve a farm lane by pushing soil onto the mounds. So that's why I don't know exactly how many mounds exist in Iowa City um, because they're kind of obscured at the Henricksburger Mound Group. Uh, the Slavata Mound Group. This, this one is also in Hickory Hill Park. Um, this was first noted in, uh, again in 1903, and it was just two mounds noted at the crest of a ridge, and it was, it was given a legal location in so many uh, miles south of uh, Rochester, or uh, half a mile south of Rochester Road, and so and so was farm and uh, overlooking such and such creek. And by using old property maps, I was able to figure out approximately where the mound group was, and it was probably on this crest of this ridge within this blue field. Somewhere there was two mounds, and maybe in the 1930s there's a faint trace of something, but I, you know, I, I think that's, uh, I'm deluding myself on that one. Um, this is what the area looks like today. I'm sure you guys recognize this. This is uh, the Hickory Hill Park, uh, huge dam in the center of the park, and all this area was borrowed about 1980 uh, to create the dam. Uh, there was a little lumpy bump on the ridge to the uh, northeast of the dam, uh, which uh, tested in 2011, and it, it's just an erosional remnant. It's, it's, not a, it's not a prehistoric cultural mound, it's just a little 
knob that hadn't eroded away. So the Slavata Mound Group is uh, gone as far as I can tell. Uh, the Terrell Mill Group. Uh, the Terrell Mill Group is in the uh, north part of Iowa City. There was 20 mounds noted in 1883. Uh, by 1904, it was down to six or possibly a little bit more mounds noted in this area. By the 1930s, a road had been built over the center of the site. And by the 1960s, this whole area would be, had become a subdivision. Um, there, there's some kind of suspicious rises if you kind of poke through people's yards and stuff. And so it needs, it needs, a, better, it needs a better study. But uh, there, there's no clear evidence of the Terrell Mill Group left anymore. There was an isolated mound called 13JH251. Uh, I'm sorry, there was uh, an, an isolated, uh, oh, the Randall Mound, a 13JH32 uh, was uh, just immediately north of the Terrell Mill Group. It was probably was part of the same group. And that was still standing in the 1960s and was excavated by uh, Bob Brower of the university. But apparently he found no artifacts within the mound and he never, again, never wrote a report. So I, we don't really know exactly what he found. And there's nothing on file at the OSA. We have no artifacts associated with it, and we have no report associated with it, and we don't know where that mound is anymore. Um, so there, there, that's probably little vestiges of the, the Terrell Mound Group. Um, so in 1900, there's 115 mounds in or near our study area. Today there's about 20 near Iowa City, and four or five in our study area. There is uh, an isolated mound. Um, uh, there was an isolated mound along Rapid Creek, but recent, uh, study, uh, recent survey looked all over for it and could not find it where exactly where it was supposed to be. We know exactly where it's supposed to be and it's not there. And then there is an extant mound on the south side of town. And there's actually four mound groups that are completely lost. Uh, they have, the original accounts of them are so vague that we don't know exactly where they are. They were somewhere along Rapid Creek. Uh, the the Grizel Mound Group had about 15 mounds. Uh, the Sunier Mound was an isolated mound. This, I think, uh, the, the Acre Mound had uh, uh, four or five. Uh, this is 13JH1 extension, you know, the account that there was 50 mounds associated with it. And there was four or five over here at the uh, Price Mound Group. But those are just approximate triangles. We don't e exactly know where they are. We just have kind of vague legal location descriptions of them, and there isn't anything obvious on the ground anymore. The question you might have is why are there no, why did the earliest explorers make absolutely no mention of mounds in downtown Iowa City. You'd think that there would be mounds here because you know, we, downtown has like this beautiful bluff over, you know, overlooking this nice river valley. So part, the, the reason Iowa City was put where it was is because of this beautiful uh, bluff works. So why are there no mounds noted in the early histories of, of Iowa City? Uh, and I think there's two reasons for it. One comes from a line of evidence that we got at the School of Music uh, Excavations, which is at the corner of uh, Clinton and Burlington. And, okay, this, this is Clinton Street. This bulldozer is sitting on Clinton Street. Here, you see this line? That is the original bluff edge. Uh, it is 10 feet below surface, and there's just historic fill on top of it. And if you look carefully at this uh, original bluff edge, there's no evidence of plowing, and there's just sort of this, uh, you know, heavily oxidized material just kind of welded to it. Um, and it, it appears that this was an erosional surface to begin with. And so if there had been mounds built along the bluffs in downtown Iowa City, if this is typical, they wouldn't have lasted long enough for, for early settlers to have observed them. They would have, you know, washed down the bluff. Uh, uh, and another reason might also be that uh, Although we have a, a very picturesque valley to have, you know, the bluffs on either side of the river so close to each other, that's actually probably not what uh, late prehistoric and woodland Indians would have wanted in, in a location if they're farmers. They probably would have preferred to have larger terraces and a lar wider floodplain in the southern part of town, for example, or the northern part of town um, where, where Rapid Creek area comes in. Uh, mm -hmm. So if People probably didn't want to make, uh, pro people probably weren't, uh, this wasn't an ideal location for prehistoric farmers, so that might explain why there are no mounds, no mounds associated with them because they may not have been living in, in this tight little valley when there's much better areas to the north and to the south. Okay, late prehistoric. Oh, this is pretty scant. There's a little, little bits of late prehistoric stuff has been found at excavations on the south side of town, uh, but no features. The only real diagnostic you know, you, and also at the Acre Mound, again, we had uh, the one pot and maybe the buffalo effigy. So a little bit of evidence up there. Uh, within Iowa City, we have 
one passing mention, and this just came maybe two or three years ago. Somebody called her, actually called, uh, they called the museum here because long ago, back in the 50s, his father had been digging a house that he was going to rent, and they dug up a catlinite pipe, and he donated it to the university. He wanted to know if the museum had it, and uh, the museum had no idea of if they had it. They, well, they, they didn't have it. Uh, so they referred them to our office, and we had no, nothing that matched that description whatsoever. But I got, at least got an address where it came from. So we know that somewhere in Iowa City, somebody found a catlinite pipe, which might be late prehistoric. There typically are, but you know, uh, catlinite pipes can even be through the historic period. This is Samuel Calvin of the university. He went to Pipestone Quarry. At, this is about 1880s or 1890s and took a photograph of uh, quarrying at, at, uh, of the Catlinite mound groups. And just so that you could see a picture of it, I just, this is a, a, um, a pipe that came from uh, Henry County to the south of here. So uh, there isn't a lot of uh, late prehistoric material. And it might, again, be related to the fact that there, uh, the broad floodplains of the south part of town are accretional and will be burying material. So you aren't going to find a lot of it. And there hasn't been a lot of archaeological work and survey up uh, to the north part of town uh, along the Rock, Rapid Creek area, uh, which might ha house them. Uh, this is the historic Indian sites. Uh, this is where Iowa City kind of shines. And this has to do with uh, the Napoleon Park area south of town. Uh, beginning in the 1830s, uh, John, Sh uh, um, let me start over here. Well, it, in the south part of town, there was a, uh, uh, okay. Uh, on the south part of town, John Gilbert came in the 1830s and set up a trading post. After the uh, uh, Black Hawk uprising, through a series of treaties, uh, it was agreed that the uh, Sauk and Meskwaki were going to be forced out of the state. And they shifted from the Mississippi Valley, and a lot of them were shifted onto the Iowa River Valley, south of what would later be Iowa City. And then later, they're all shifted to Des Moines, and then they're removed from the state in 1840, uh, 1848, uh, no, 1846. Uh, but in the uh, 1830s to early 1840s, there was two villages uh, south of town, uh, occupied primarily by the Meskwaki, but also by some Sauk. And John Gilbert was the primary trader associated with them. And he, he had big hopes for a fledging lean town called Napoleon. And uh, Wako uh, Shashi uh, was uh, one of the leaders of the uh, Meskwaki, and he has a, his enigmatic uh, trading paper, uh, which is what enigmatic talking paper in which he depicts all sorts of animals. And there's been a great deal of academic debate about what the meaning of, of this paper is. It's a, it's a great illustration. Um, the, there is a very crude map that was published in 1883 that seems to be like kind of like a X marks the spot thing. It shows the town site of Napoleon. It shows uh, Wap uh, Wapashaki's villages. It shows Powashik's Indian town. It shows the two trading houses associated with it. It shows a big marsh. It shows the road. It shows a road leading to Burlington Muscatine. It shows the location of Gilbert Creek. It shows the location of the terrace edge. It shows the location of the burials. And you think this would just be the perfect map that would help you know, guide you to the exact spot where these sites are. But in fact, this is not worked at all. Uh, no, the, the, none of these villages have been, none of the Indian villages have been found, even though there's been a lot of survey for them. Uh, the cemeteries have not been found. Uh, maybe one of the trading posts has been found, but not, and I'll get into that, not clearly. Uh, Napoleon has been found archaeologically, and that's because it was well known from later maps. So this, this, this uh, 1883 map is kind of a red herring. Uh, it, it really hasn't been as helpful as people expected it would be. Uh, the Napoleon Park site, uh, 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 13JH 743, uh, this was uh, excavated in, um, well, I'm getting out of order here. Okay. Napoleon Park site, this was excavated in 1997. Uh, this was within the town site of Napoleon. Uh, and the, a, a cellar was excavated as well as a, a limestone line fire pit. And uh, lots of artifacts dating between 1837 and 1850 were recovered. Um, so this, this is 
probably the remains of the oldest farm within Johnson County, and it was associated with the early Napoleon, uh, a Napoleon town site. Whether it's the whether they found the evidence of the first courthouse uh, that w was in Johnson County is, is a debated question. But they did find a, a remains of a structure that dates to that time period. Uh, Gilbert's trading post. Uh, th this was his American Fur Company trading post, uh, J8775. Uh, the location of this was supposed to have been known pretty well based upon uh, local landowners having found stuff and comparisons with uh, maps. Uh, permission was given to excavate four test units. Uh, they encountered several pit features including uh, trade goods, beads, mirrors, uh, a, a compass uh, needle, silver foil, pipes, jaw harp, um, lots of brass, a strike light, uh, gun parts, uh, French and English flints. Uh, but there was no other than these kind of vague pit features, there was no structural evidence of a Gilbert's trading post. So it's, yeah, I, I think that those excavations that were done by Sidney Peterson are, are pretty close. Um, and she didn't, she wasn't able to get permission to go onto the properties where she thought would be more promising. So there's still stuff out there. Um, and recently at the School of Music, we found a very strange feature. Uh, and again, this is that, that location at the corner of Clinton and, uh, uh, Clinton and Burlington streets where the Future School of Music is and uh, here's Cindy and she's sitting uh, you know about probably 14 feet below the the grade of Clinton Street and uh, I was monitoring construction activity and a track hoe hit a bunch of, of, of limestone you know way deep into this uh, where there wasn't supposed to be anything and pulled a whole bunch of limestone out which is actually the edge of this this edge of this foundation and so we, we stopped excavate, uh, we stopped the construction. Uh, we did a test excavation. It was a one meter by two meter excavation. You can still see the faint uh, base of our excavation across this feature. And we realized that there, there was an intact uh, foundation associated with it. And when we were digging that one by two test meter unit, I, I pulled out a stone from it and a, a, adhered to the soil on that stone was a about 50 drawn glass trade beads uh, from, uh, from the early Indian trade, um, which was the damnedest thing. Why were these trade beads shoved into this foundation uh, that's not even, you know, it's a few miles from Napoleon, which is where all the Indian trade is supposed to be going on. And why is this foundation so tiny? I mean, this is like, you know, the size of a double bed. Um, well, Trolling through the uh, historic accounts, you can, uh, we actually could get some uh, explanations for it. Uh, there's circumstantial evidence that, uh, that, that a claim cabin was built in this area by John G. Morrow in eight, early 1839. Uh, we have an account of Morrow building a claim cabin. He gives a legal description, but his legal description doesn't match his verbal description of the parcel. His legal description is a parcel that's away from the river, but he, he's actually describing something that's along the river. And he's also describing something that uh, matches pretty closely where this location is. And his legal description was done before the government land office surveys, so he probably didn't know where he was legally. He just, but he, uh, so this might have been associated with that. Uh, this is much smaller than the dimensions he gave for his claim cabin, which itself was pretty tiny, but this is about half the size of the dimensions of his claim cabin. So either this is, uh, the claim cabin and something that he just threw up hastily to prove that he had possession of this par property because in order to take possession of, of a claim you have to improve it by building a structure on it. So either he built a really tiny structure or we, we, we've never found his claim cabin and this is just some sort of outbuilding perhaps associated with it or it's completely unrelated to him and it's just somebody else who happens to be here who ha happens to have uh, some sort of trade going on with Indians. But I, I like Morrow because we can actually tie him because he purchased, he actually bought this title claim from a, a Samuel Baumgartner, who was a, an acquaintance of John Gilbert, and was actually uh, uh, one of the one of the uh, uh, um, witnesses on uh, on Gilbert's last will and testament. So there there is actually a connection between the guy who we think might have built this and the uh, trading post to the south. And so when this foundation was excavated, it had all kinds of material dating the 1830s, 1840s but we never found any more trade beads. All, that, all the trade beads that we found were tucked under the one stone sitting right here. 
it was, you know, we, we were expecting to find all kinds of trade goods in there, but we never found an, another bit of trade good beyond what we'd found. It was filled with appropriate H uh, junk, but there wasn't anything, uh, any trade goods. To the side of it, there was a, uh, the top of a barrel it was probably just uh, the rotted bottom of a, um, of a rain barrel, which had some, some uh, material from that same time period, uh, but nothing what would we hope to find. And this is, this actually, uh, Cindy is sitting on uh, the original landform. You remember that welded surface? That's what she's sitting on. It's, it's, a, it's actually been shaved a few centimeters, but if you go a little bit aside, you, you can see the original surface. So this, this was your, the original surface. It wasn't a, uh, wasn't a true basement. It was just kind of cut into the ground uh, for a structure that was above the uh, surface, and which is all filled over with 14 feet of fill and then, uh, a few decades later. Uh, so here's the drawn grass trade beads. And uh, oh, also when we were working at, um, uh, recently at the School of Music just south of the Iowa Memorial Union, uh, in flotation we found one little trade bead, um, probably something that fell off of somebody when they're walking through, or maybe it's a sign that there's going to be more in, in that general area. Uh, historic American sites. There are a, a lot of historic American sites, and this primarily has to do with cultural resources management and survey is that they're, they're obligated to record every site that they find, even if it's like a mid 20th century trash dump or a 1890s farmstead, stuff that you know, typical archeological collectors wouldn't be that interested in. So we, we have a lot of these uh, historic American sites. Now, only a handful of them have been excavated. Probably the, the, best, the most famous excavations were at Plum Grove. Um, this is, was the work, Tom Charlton, uh, 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 who was a professor at anthropology here, uh, started a field school there in 1974, and he excavated on and off uh, un until he died in 2010. In fact, he died during field school uh, in 2010. Not, not at site, he uh, was actually at his office, but uh, you know, he, he was dedicated to this, and he worked it to the, to the very end of his life. Um, and the reason that Plum Grove is, is famous and preserved as a house, of course, is because of uh, Robert Lucas, who was never uh, the governor of Iowa. He was the territorial governor of Iowa, the first territorial governor of Iowa, but he was the governor of, of Ohio. And when he was governor of Ohio, he was famous for almost getting Ohio into a war with Michigan over its state boundary. He, he was something of a hothead. And when he came to Iowa, he almost got Iowa into uh, a war with Missouri over its boundary again. It's called the Honey War. Uh, but fortunately, never these, n neither of these wars actually percolated into true wars. Uh, yeah, Lucas was, was definitely a hothead. He um, was challenged to a duel by his brother-in-law because his brother-in-law thought he was dishonoring his sister. Um, and their friends had both of them locked up in jail to prevent the duel from occurring. Uh, and when he came to Iowa, his daughter um, uh, fell in love with a, uh, an, an itinerant uh, uh, man who uh, impregnated her, and Lucas had had this man, even though he married his daughter to, to make it honorable, he had this man institutionalized in an insane asylum because he was so angry about it and used his authority as, uh, uh, as territorial governor to do this, and, and this poor man had to get a, a variety of judges to attest to his sanity so that he could be released from jail, and he just kind of... Uh, became a, a very bitter man. This, this picture of him is from when he was governor of Ohio. This is a picture of him uh, after he was retired at Plum Grove. And uh, he, he was writing, uh, he, he just, uh, you know, just, he, he would like write uh, like lengthy letters about people who were dead for 20 years, you know, just, just how angry he was about them. You know, just, just, just a very bitter man. Um, so he, he probably, you know, really did look kind of like that. But, um, so, but we, we dug and dug and dug at Plum Grove over a, a, a period of, uh, um, since 1974 till quite recently. Uh, this is a, a cistern that was uh, excavated, I think in 1980, 82, somewhere in there um, before my time. And it was full of junk from the 1940s after the state had purchased the land as a memorial for, uh, for, for Lucas. And it, it, it was just filled to the brim with, with garbage. And this really il illustrates a, a very interesting phenomenon that, that was seen at Plum Grove is that although Robert Lucas was possibly the richest man or the most influential man in Iowa City, we, we excavated almost no artifacts from the Lucas period. Everything that came 
almost everything that came came from later occupants. After Lucas, he sold it to the Hoyt family, who were also very influential. Uh, uh, Eleanor Hoyt Brainerd became a, a famous uh, writer, and uh, actually a couple of her movie, a couple of her books were turned into early uh, silent films. Um, the family after that was the Switzers. They were kind of struggling middle class. The, the father worked in a bank as, as a head cashier, and they were using the farm uh, to subsidize their income. Um, then the house was sold to a variety of people and wound up uh, the, the family of uh, William and Winnie Hughes lived in the house, and they were so poor they were selling vegetables door to door during the Depression to make a living. So you go from a very rich family to a very poor family over uh, four generations. And, but the archaeology is inverted. Almost nothing comes from the Lucas period. And the, 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 Hoy, the, the Hughes family are producing so much garbage, they probably account for 75, 90% of the material that came from there. And this is a reflection of the changes in the greater economy. You, you, you have the Lucases who are probably living in an economy where everything they own was either biodegradable or reusable. Uh, and even though they were rich, uh, they didn't leave much debris to show it. Uh, whereas the Hughes, who are extremely poor, they're living in a disposable economy where they can buy uh, canned food very cheaply, they can buy uh, used secondhand dishes very cheaply, and uh, th this material can, can uh, accumulate quite dramatically. So you know, it really drives home the point that what you get in archaeology, the, the quantity of material and even the quality of material doesn't necessarily reflect the occupants who are living at the site. Um, the, probably the coolest feature, uh, so cool that it was excavated four different times uh, uh, on four different years, which uh, is, is this trench of uh, butchered animal bone. I think the final count was 15 or so cattle, or I, I don't remember, but 15 or so cattle and uh, a dozen pig and a half dozen sheep, all apparently butchered at the same time, all dumped in this long trench along the side of the house. And it's just the, the, the butchering scraps, the heads and the ends of the feet. And you can see uh, from this chorus line of cattle how the cattle were killed, a ball peen hammer. And, uh, and this is also cool because it's really one of the few times in archaeology where you can see very clear cut evidence of people being uh, a part of a national system. There's no way that, that, uh, that the owners of the house, probably the 1880s, the Switzers, could have used this many cattle and this many sheep and this many pigs at one time. This had to have been a group effort involving lots of people, and they had to have been part of a, a larger market to get, this, to get all this butchered meat out of the farm uh, before it decayed. And, and so it's pretty rare that you can see such clear-cut evidence of integration into national networks, you know, of, of uh, railroad lines going all the way to Chicago, of refrigerated train lines going to Chicago, of uh, you know, coordinated uh, uh, butchering efforts so Plum Grove is, is, is a very cool site. Um, uh, other excavations in, from the historic period in Iowa City uh, was the Pest House. This was excavated by uh, uh, Dr. Charlton uh, uh, beginning 1973 and in 1974, I believe. And this was a, the Pest House. This was, I believe, the third of four Pest House uh, that was built by the county uh, for um, uh, for poor people who have communicable diseases could live uh, uh, in isolation from other people. Um, this was built about 1900. It had plumbing. As you can see, there's a, still a stack pipe. Uh, um, and there are photographs of it. It was apparently pretty nice. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Charlton died before he could write up his results. Um, so one of the things that we did during the field school in 2011 was to sort of brush away all the material that's on top of it. Uh, and uh, photograph it and map it better so that uh, when, when Dr. Charlton's notes are written up, there's a good map that, that can be used to compare it with. Um, and, and this is also in Hickory Hill Park, the uh, archaeological nexus of, of Iowa City. Um, the, the School of Music excavations, I'm coming back here for the third time, and again, we're, uh, this is that foundation that I described earlier that had the trade beads in it. This area was also full of cisterns. Uh, cisterns are like big underground, I showed you one just, just a minute ago, but it's a big underground brick structure that's used to hold water that runs off the roof um, so that you have a fresh water supply uh, in, in the period before um, uh, municipal water was standardized. Most, most structures had cisterns uh, in the 19th century. So we found a whole bunch of cisterns in this area, I think six or seven of them. 
and we found the very early foundation with the trade beads in it. We also found a uh, well that's under excavation over here uh, that had some material that was predated the 1920s at the top, and so we had big hopes that the bottom of the well would have very old stuff in it. And a privy uh, over here which dated to the mid 19th century. And you know, I found all these. Per I personally found all these while monitoring, but you know, I was assigned to do the uh, the, the privy, which is a, a latrine. <laughs> so, yeah. So well, there you go. Uh, you notice before I'd shown a picture of uh, people excavating the, the, the cistern at, at Plum Grove. You know, there they actually climbed into the cistern and pulled material out. There's no way that OSHA would let us do that kind of stuff anymore. Um, so what we had to do now is we would, uh, when they're uh, doing construction, they'd hit the top of a cistern. We'd look at the top, we'd see the age of the material in there, and typically it's stuff from the 1960s. And then we'd have them pull back away the wall, and we'd have them stop. We'd look at the material, pull back some more. We'd look at the material, pull back some more, look at the material. Because we wanted to find uh, early stuff. We wanted to find stuff that's you know, from the early 20th century at least, and hopefully from the 19th century. But this one, when we got all the way to the bottom of this really deep cistern, got to the bottom, and at the bottom there's like a 7-up crown cap bottle. You know, like the stuff that I remember drinking as a kid. So that, this had clearly been filled in in the 1960s uh, when, when, the, uh, when the lot was developed for banks. And th that was true of, of all the cisterns, that none of them had early material within them. Uh, but it was a lot of work uh, and pain to, to, to safely excavate them. Uh, this is the well feature at the School of Music. At first I thought it was the top of a cistern, but then as, as I'm clearing it up, it looked a, a lot more interesting. It wasn't made of brick, it was made of stone, which uh, cisterns are never made of loose, unmortared stone. Uh, and so it was slowly peeled back. Here is it, we peeled it back one half at a time. Peeling it away, here are the stones on the side. Here is like, you know, uh, metal cans that had been thrown in, into the well. Uh, and all the material uh, dated to before 1920. So sometime around 1920 it had been filled up. And the strangest artifact that has ever been recovered in Iowa archaeology came from there. I thought it was a nursing bottle, uh, but it, it turns out it's actually a lady's uh, uh, hygienic syringe. And it's exactly what you think it is. <laughs> and also a uh, music stand, uh, or a music clip holder in the shape of a, of a music lyre, which is quite appropriate for the uh, School of Music excavations. Um, and here is my pride and joy, uh, the, the, the privy. And the privy had material that dated from the 1850, well, 1840s to 1850, well, I guess the 1860s technically. So pre-Civil War material within it. And it was the strangest thing. It, you have this layer of uh, dense fecal material um, full of just raspberry seeds. I mean, I, whoever was there, it, they were filling it up when raspberries were in season, I can tell you that. Um, and the other weird thing, well, I guess raspberry isn't that weird, but uh, the other really remarkable thing is it was full of lamp glass, uh, like the lamps, uh, covers from old oil, old oil lamps. Um, these are actually from whale oil lamps, uh, these very long, narrow, tapering lamp glass, and there was about 50 of them in here, which is very, very strange indeed. And we thought, well, maybe a chandelier fell and broke and somebody just threw it in here. But we found some of them were completely intact. And we found them at the bottom of the fecal layers and at the top of the fecal layers. Then somebody had come by and capped it all off with a, a whole bunch of uh, lime and ash, you know, to keep the smell out or whatever. And it's, it's bowed because it had settled. As the fecal material rots away, you know, the, 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 the center sinks down. So it was, it was probably flat when they filled it in. And then it was recommissioned, and you have another layer of fecal material on top of that, and then a very thin layer uh, of, of a second cap and then it was all filled in. And all this was inside a barrel. This is actually a wood-lined barrel that was cut into that uh, A horizon. Here's the, the top of that welded surface again. And it was actually cut through some of the fill that was overlying that into, this, uh, into the original soil. Uh, and part of the, the barrel is ex was dug into the original soil, and part of it was extending out of it. Uh, so it was, you know, uh, just a, a very strange way to, to make a privy, I think. But uh, um, so we have the question: Why, why do we have this thing that's full of lamp glass and raspberry seeds? And it was filled up very quickly because you have lamp glass at the top and lamp glass at the bottom. And I can't imagine that people are just sort of periodically throwing a lamp in. You know, every few years they throw another lamp glass in. I, 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 this appears to have been 
all in one episode from top to bottom. So, uh, and again, the historic research really helps out because we find out that on the same block uh, and uh, to the uh, north of there, there was the old Presbyterian church. Um, let me get my years right here. The old Presbyterian church, which was built in the 1840s, one of the first churches in Iowa City. In 1856, uh, it burned and was abandoned. In 1868, uh, the abandoned church was renovated and was transferred to the State Historical Society and became the first freestanding State Historical Society building. Um, and it was the State Historical Society building until 1882, and then it became a church again, and then a couple decades later it was demolished. Uh, so this is a plausible explanation for why there's all this lamp glass. If, if this church burned in 1856, that would at least explain why you have a huge amount of lamps coming out of one location, some of them not broken, that need to be discarded at one time. You know, the fire may have damaged uh, uh, the, the, the lamp bases, uh, or maybe they just wanted to clean things out, or it could have been from the 1868 renovation of the, uh, uh, of the church to become the State Historical Society. And as you have a lot of workers doing this renovation, well, they need a privy, and uh, they're gonna be discarding things in there, and it happens to be when uh, raspberries are in bloom, uh, or not in bloom, but raspberries are fruiting. So that's, I mean, if you can have a better explanation, I don't know, that's the, you know, it's, 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 it's all hearsay, but that's, that's what I've come up with. Um, Hubbard Park. This uh, is the park immediately south of the Iowa Memorial Union. Uh, the water main of the, the university is putting a new chilled water main system through the park and uh, they uh, encountered several features that appeared to be pretty old but by the time the archaeologists got out there the, the pipe had already been put at the bottom of it and all we could do was look at the wall and say well yeah, it might have been old and we'd like to do more in the future but they're not going to do any more because the pipe is already there. Uh, but at one point, they stopped as they were about to turn in the northwest part of, or the northeast part of the park. They're turning angle, and they had to stop, and they hit a foundation as they stopped. And as we're cleaning up that foundation, it wasn't that remarkable. It's from a house that was uh, filled in in the 1920s when the park was built. Ah, but next to that foundation, we found a second foundation of limestone that was associated with a buried A horizon. Uh, we love these buried A's. So this is the top of a buried A horizon. This is the wall of, of the excavation unit that was dug out by the machine. They've actually stepped it back for us to make it safe, so the wall is actually much higher. This is about a meter below surface. And you can see the trench going down to this jumble of rocks, and here, coming out across the trench, is a, is a line of limestone. And this, so this is the trench for a foundation that was here. Over here, you can actually see it right here, is the foundation from the house from a later house was destroyed in 1924. And this stain here is from a clamshell digger coming to rip out the foundations of that house. So we have three things going on. We have an original A horizon with a trench going down to an old foundation. We have a house that was built in the late 19th century uh, that was standing in 1926 that was demolished. But we didn't know how old this, this house was, but we knew it was reasonably old uh, just based upon this, this sort of context. Oh, here it is in plan. You can faintly see the line of limestone going across here. Here's the line of brick that, that was associated with the, with the uh, later house. Um, so we got uh, permission to excavate the step backs of the trench that they had originally done to make it safe so we could go in the first time. And so we excavate, we, we removed the soil, all the fill that was above the buried A horizon, exposed the buried A horizon, broke it into zones and screened it all. And the material that came from it was all from uh, the 1830s to 1850s. Uh, again, the very earliest time period of, of Iowa City. Uh, we found some older stuff too. You know, there's, there's, there's some uh, couple uh, uh, points, like this really uh, reworked archaic point. Uh, there's a lot of debate as to what kind of point that is. I think it's just still reworked. We, we don't really know. Uh, here's a trade token from Belvedere, Illinois, from a stove manufacturer. And we know that stove manufacturer was in existence in the 1850s. We don't know when it began or ended. We, we're pulling that stuff out of the, out of the surface. Uh, so we knew we had an, an, an intact surface that was buried uh, probably around 1850. Uh, and we knew that the, the water main was going to continue. And so after much negotiation, we got permission to excavate 
a sample of the rest of the water main before it went through the park. Uh, so we could retrieve what we could re retrieve, but yet allow the, uh, um, allow the university to at least not be horribly behind on their schedule. So they gave us a very uh, cut and dry time period to dig what we could in that time period, get it out of the way uh, so that they could put their pipe in through. And as compensation, they agreed to uh, let us come back later this spring when the weather's nicer and explore more of the surface throughout the park. But of course, this is in the, in the middle of January when we find all this stuff. Um, and you know how cold in January and February were. I mean, most nights were you know, 10 below and many days never got above zero. Uh, so they had to construct a uh, circus tent over the pipeline trench uh, so that we could, not because they cared about us and our, and our cold hands, but because the soil would, so the soil wouldn't freeze so that we could actually excavate it. So we had tents and thermal blankets and uh, 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 diesel forced air heaters um, to, to keep the soil from, from freezing. It was quite cozy in there. We couldn't actually keep the whole tent heated at one time because it, when it doesn't get above zero, it doesn't matter. You're in a tent. You know, you, you just can't keep the whole tent warm. So we'd have to block off sections of the tent that we could keep reasonably warm. And so we'd cram everybody into one section of a tent. And so here we are trying not to stick our elbows into each other's noses. Um, and we found more foundations uh, that are associated with that buried A horizon. And we also found later foundations from later houses that we were expecting to find there. And some of the more, and then we, we, we finally figured out what had happened. And there are historic accounts of a huge flood that destroyed the town of Des Moines in 1851. There are historic accounts of it destroying all the houses uh, in the low part of Iowa City along the river in 1851. And so we have this fluvially deposited soil on top of a plow zone on top of a buried A horizon. And everything in here dates to the 1850s or earlier. We had one coin that dated to 1851, and that was the uh, youngest coin we had. And we had one going back to 1833 and one to 1849. So it's pretty consistent with the flood of 1851, trashing this neighborhood, burying everything in silt, and then people come back later and build a new neighborhood on top of it. And so there are areas of the park that still have this original town of, of Iowa City uh, material within it. So that was pretty cool. Um, so we would dig through the A-horizon. You can see on the wall like this dark soil, the A-horizon. We get to the bottom of this buried A-horizon, the buried topsoil. And in some places we could see plow scars from when they had done gardening or plowing uh, in the 1850s. Um, so it's a very neat site and we'll, we will be going back there um, th this summer to explore more of it. So, you know, Iowa City didn't, didn't look very promising. If you're just to look at the early accounts of it, you know, Compared to the, sort of the, uh, the hot spots of Iowa, Iowa City should have been pretty boring, but it, actually because so much of it has been so intensively surveyed and, uh, uh, and investigated and reinvestigated, you can really pull out what a typical spot of Iowa would have. And I suspect that if you were to dig anywhere in Iowa, this along you know, one of the secondary uh, uh, rivers like Iowa, like the Iowa River, you're gonna find the same sorts of stuff. You're gonna find the mound groups. You're gonna find intact, uh, woodland and archaic deposits. You're going to find uh, uh, early trading uh, uh, sites. You're going to find uh, interesting historic uh, features. And in fact, if you're going to extrapolate for the amount of sites in, in, in Iowa City, like in the survey area, we have 2.64 sites per kilometer. If you extrapolate that out to the state of Iowa, right now we have 26,000 sites recorded in Iowa, which seems like a lot. But if Iowa is typical, we should have 384,762 archaeological sites in the state of Iowa. So Iowa, really, so Iowa City really sh shows the potential that all of Iowa has uh, for archaeology. And it also shows that, although it may look unremarkable, there, if you look in an area enough, you're going to find a lot of uh, remarkable sites out there. So that's what I got for you. Thank you.